Welcome back. It's good to be here with you again, and I, uh, I pray that you had a great week this last week. Um, today, I would like to continue on the discussion that we, that we started last week about uh, healing the broken heart. Uh, so, so last week, we, we talked a little about how we can heal physical things of people. Broken arms and, and cuts and, and those sort of things. We're real technologically advanced in that. But, uh, but how do you bind up a broken heart? How do you, how do you heal someone who, who has a heart that's broken? Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, a specific kind of broken heart. One thing we brought up last week was the diversity of how uh, many ways that a heart can be broken with loss or with broken families or with, uh, you know, just any, any number of things that people uh, could be hurting in their heart from. Uh, today, we are going to talk about broken hearted because of sin and how God heals the broken hearted. Uh, who are that way because of the sin that they have. And so, uh, as we begin our conversation, I want you to know that uh, right off the bat, the pathway to, to healing a broken heart because of sin begins with forgiveness. The way to heal a broken heart that's broken because of sin, the, the, the ointment that you place over it to heal it is, uh, is forgiveness. You know, King David uh, was, was uh, it said that he was the man after God's own heart. But there was a time in his life whenever when his heart was the very heart of God. But you know, he abandoned that one time and betrayed, uh, betrayed one, of his, one of his best friends and faithful uh, comrades and ended up having him killed. Uh, he betrayed you know, his family, he betrayed God, he betrayed Israel as their king in, in how he behaved. And in that moment, Whenever he was confronted by the prophet, he penned Psalm 51, which is uh, which is a, a psalm that is crying out for the forgiveness of God. And I want to read to you a portion of it, uh, starting in down in verse 10. David says. Now this will be verses 10 through verse 17. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings, the sacrifices of God, here it is, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. At one of the lowest points in, in David's life, and now, and understand, this man had been on the run for his life. He had been, 
uh, living among the, the enemies, the Philistines, and acting like a crazy person for fear of his life. Uh, uh, of all the, the situations that he had been in, this was was possibly to this point the lowest part David had ever had ever been because he felt the separation that his sin had made between him and God. And so his plea, his plea to God is that he would create within him a clean heart and renew a steadfast or a faithful spirit because his spirit had been led astray. His heart had been corrupted by his behavior, his lying and his and his adultery and, and you know and all, all these other and murder. His heart had been corrupted and his spirit has was 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 defiled. And he says, I want the presence of your Holy Spirit. I want the joy of your salvation. I want you to deliver me from the blood I owe. And, and he says, you know what? You don't delight in sacrifices. If, if, if God wanted sacrifices of cattle, David could have killed every cow in Israel. And blood would have ran thigh deep throughout all of Jerusalem. But that's not what God wanted. And I understand that there's a sacrificial system within the law of Moses that, that, that these people lived within. But God, God doesn't really want that. What, what He wants behind all of that is a broken spirit. And David says, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. God doesn't hate it whenever, whenever we've done something that, that has, has separated us from Him. When our spirit is broken and our heart is broken because we, we have this a separation in our relationship with God, God doesn't I hate our broken heart. He wants us to have a broken heart because it shows that we want His presence. In in Jeremiah thirty one, um, speaking of the law of Moses, you know, in the in the covenant that God had with Israel, in, in Jeremiah thirty one, specifically thirty one through thirty four, you can look it up for yourself. But God promises that a new covenant's coming. And He says that that new covenant, the benchmark of that new covenant will be, I will forgive your sins and your iniquity I will remember no more. That God, that, that God won't remember our sin anymore. Within that new covenant, He, he won't remember it anymore. There's also this passage in Isaiah. It's at the, the very end of Isaiah, in Isaiah 66. Uh, God is addressing um, some people that, you know, they, they thought that their God was kind of lucky to have them on His side. <laughs> uh, that, that sort of mentality. And in, and in Isaiah 66... God says this through Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And where is a place that I might rest? Like, what are you going to bring to me? What are you really going to give to God that's going to fulfill God? God is, is, is perfect, and He is self-sustaining. He doesn't need anything from, from us. He doesn't need anything from these people. So he says, well, what is it that I want? 
In verse 2 he says, My hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being. But to this one will I look. You want to know who God's really interested in. To this one I will look. To him who is humble, who is contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. The one who doesn't see God as lucky that, that I'm on his side, but instead sees how blessed we are that God would take interest in us. With a contrite spirit, a broken spirit, a broken heart, and that whenever God says something, that whenever we read something of God, it moves us. It moves us to, to action. It moves us to behavior. So, from the very beginning, sin has separated us from God. When we, when we sin, we are separated. God doesn't want it that way. He never intended for it to be that way. And He promises that, that He will do everything in His part to make a new covenant between him and man that that sin is going to be dealt with and done away with. And so the broken heart that you have because of the separation can be healed. Jesus, Jesus whenever he was first talking about uh, the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew chapter 5, hang on a second, I'll get there. Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gives uh, what is uh, commonly called the Beatitudes. And it is these blessings. And and, and I want to propose something to you. You can read through them yourself, Matthew 5, uh, starting in verse 3 down to verse 12. Um, there, there are these blessings that Jesus gives. And it regards the kingdom of God. So, uh, at the end of chapter 4, it says that Jesus goes around teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And when it gets into this actual sermon, I like to look at these Beatitudes as a progression. They are a walk. And there's a starting place for this walk. The question that he's addressing is, how, what about this kingdom? How are we to be a part of this kingdom? Who are we supposed to be whenever we're in this kingdom? And Jesus starts off with this. In verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The first three of these Beatitudes, it paints a picture of someone who has realized that they're separated from God. You know, I remember, um, I realize that everyone's walk in faith is not the same. Uh, God doesn't intend it to be that way, and, and, that's, and that's fine. Me personally, uh, whenever I I, I was uh, I was baptized when I was 25, and and at that time that was just the right age for me because God had given me uh, uh, enough time 
that I could, um, you know, ruin relationships with my family, ruin relationships with my friends, uh, ruin job relationships, <laughs> uh, and and at the very end, uh, my life was ruined because of my behavior and the choices that I had made. And in this moment where I felt I had no other place to go, it just so happened that uh, the church where my parents uh, were attending I was by there late one night, and the door happened to be open. And it was, and it was in that moment when I could very keenly feel um, the consequences of the destructive life that I had been living was that I was spiritually bankrupt. I had nothing left in my account. And and, and Jesus says, you know what, whenever you realize that that you that you have no spirit left you have no life left in your account. Then the kingdom of heaven is yours. It is at that moment when it is within your grasp. And he says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are sad because of their state. Because of where they are. Blessed are you when you feel the separation from God because of your sin. And you feel sorry for that. You feel that there's something missing from life that you just can't get on your own. You can't do it on your own. At that point, when you are mournful, then Jesus says you'll be comforted. Blessed are you. Happy are you when you're mourning. Because you're going to be comforted. And he says, blessed are the meek or gentle. For they will inherit the land. Um, and, and what meekness is? Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is power under control. When, when your power of choice that has led you out into being separated from God, when you take that power of choice and you bring it underneath the mighty hand of God, whenever you humble that, into the mighty hand of God. At that point, the promised land is yours. And, and as you go ahead and, and read through this progression, it ends up with, you are a light to the world. You're salt to the earth. And, and people are able to see God through you, and they will glorify Him. In, in 1 John 1, John speaks of this fellowship that we have with God. How to maintain the fellowship. So, so you realize the brokenness. You ask for forgiveness and God comforts you with that forgiveness. And John, in speaking with people who are in that covenant, that have been forgiven, he says in John 1, Verse 8 and 9. 
If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The road to healing the broken heart because of sin comes through and is maintained by forgiveness. And today, God is extending His hand out to you that if there's something standing between you and Him, it doesn't matter what it is. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill that covenant so that you could be with Him because He wants you. He loves you. And your wounded heart, He will not despise, but He will embrace and comfort you. And there is no one who you can trust more than our loving, forgiving Father. I hope you have a great week. God bless you. We'll see you later. So... We come to a time now when we're going to remember the, the death of Jesus by taking of the bread and the cup. Um, in coming off of the thoughts that we just shared about God having this new covenant that is based on forgiveness, Jesus, during the Passover, whenever he gathered the disciples together, uh, in the middle of this, he takes, he takes a part of, of the Passover and he changes it to, to be what we are taking now. And when, it, when he does this, he says in Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. That, um, that prophecy in Jeremiah 30, uh, 31, excuse me, Jeremiah 31 31 through 34, when, when God is saying, I'm going to make a new covenant, and that covenant is going to draw you to me, and it's going to be based on forgiveness. Jesus is fulfilling that right now. And when we take of the bread, and we take of the cup, it's not just... It's not just remembering Jesus. It is remembering Jesus. But it's not just remembering Him. It's remembering that this was God's plan all along. God's plan all along is for you and me to be in union with Him by the forgiveness that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And so, let's thank God for that forgiveness and that plan and the willingness of Jesus to sacrifice himself for you and me. Shall we pray for the bread? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being so good to us, for loving us and wanting us. And I pray now that as we take this bread, that you will bless it and, and let us remember your goodness and Jesus' goodness and your great and enduring love for us as we reflect on the price that Jesus paid for us. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name. And now let us continue our prayer for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer thanking you for this cup and we're asking you to bless this fruit of the vine so that we might remember the blood that was shed, the blood that bought a new covenant in which we could be free from our sin and embrace the new life you've given us. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us and saving us. In his name, his name we pray. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, brethren, Rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. As you go through your week, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort those around you and be agreeable and peaceable. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Have a great day.